Hello, and welcome to another episode of Hacking with Friends. Today, we're going to go over some major improvements to using the ESP8266 microcontroller for hacking. In fact, we're going to go over a tool that can run on any operating system and make it incredibly easy to use this cheap microcontroller to attack wireless networks, do scans, and other really interesting things using a Rust program called the Punitor, which our friend Stefan has designed. So Stefan, thank you for joining us today. Hello, again, <laughs> for probably the third time talking about this, um, the, the offer. And uh, yeah, I, I have to say I didn't program this on my own. And most of the work actually comes from uh, from a friend called James. So shout out to him. Um, yeah. Yes, big shout out to Howdy Burgers for programming this excellent Rust tool. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, if you haven't heard of it before, the ESP8266 microcontroller is a really excellent little microcontroller that has Wi-Fi built in. And Stefan here is one of the foremost researchers who is interested in using this to basically attack Wi-Fi networks and do a lot of different novel Wi-Fi security related things that expose some of the flaws in Wi-Fi that are so serious that you can actually exploit them with this incredibly cheap device. And we see these going for $2 or so on AliExpress. You can find them on Amazon for really cheap. Uh, so people are learning that this is actually a very powerful device that can exploit modern flaws in current uh, technology, uh, Wi-Fi, that can really have a big impact on devices people are using, or even an organization that might have a lot of Wi-Fi devices that are critical for business. So this is something that can find and take out security cameras that are using Wi-Fi. It's something that can audit wireless networks to find out whether or not they're vulnerable to just basically being taken down by a small and expensive device if they're placed somewhere critical. And all that research is made possible because Stefan has put a lot of time into learning about these things and figured out how to program them in Arduino. So we've done a series of classes on this, and we've taught people a lot about how to use them. But the previous version of this excellent little microcontroller, as you can see on Stefan's screen, is, um, well, let's just say that there's a little bit of a barrier to entry when it comes to getting people on different platforms set up. Basically, you need to be able to you know, flash it and communicate with it over serial if you really want to get into the weeds with this and start doing some really more advanced stuff. So the previous version of the ESP8266 deauthor was built with a web interface. And what this allows us to do is even if someone is not really interested in getting in and doing the programming uh, or the command line stuff that we like to do, they can still access this over a web interface and use the Wi-Fi radio inside this to present a super friendly, easy to understand, and easy to use web interface that even a beginner can get started with. And of course, the nice thing is you can also do this on a mobile phone using that. So the version 2 of the deauthor was actually really successful because it meant that beginners were able to get started really quickly and take advantage of some of the most powerful features of this thing. But there were some problems. So Stefan, can you explain why when you're doing Wi-Fi hacking, um, having to serve up a uh, an interface constantly is kind of a problem when you want to do some more interesting things? Yeah. So. Um... <laughs> Just to iterate through everything you just said, uh, <laughs> uh, just uh, uh, a little bit more. So this tiny thing, you know, this is, um, it's a development board. You can program whatever you want with it. It's a, the chip that it's used. It's called the ESP8266. And um, yeah, it's just a microcontroller that can speak Wi-Fi, essentially. And I am writing software that um, makes it easy to um, do to do things this maybe wasn't intended to do uh, originally, <laughs> basically. So you can uh, run attacks, nothing special or new. Those are all old attacks, but uh, you can do some Wi-Fi hacking with it. And it just creates this kind of new um, attack vector in, in some way, because while the attacks that you can do with this aren't new, um, having such a small device that costs just a couple of dollars is super low powered. You just plug it in and it runs. Uh, that's something completely new before you had to run Linux with special tools and special uh, yeah, network cards with modified drivers. And it just gets very complicated. Um, this Once this is programmed, it's just plug and play. And actually, I can show you. I have the screenshots here if I just switch to my... Um, screen. Mm. Okay, so I'm on the wiki of the ESP8266 offer, which is the tool we are talking about. So that's the thing I made that, um, yeah, 
is made for this microcontroller uh, and with that uh, tool you can run um, different attacks. The main feature is the DOF uh, attack that is essentially like a denial of service attack. That's why it's called the offer. Um, and yeah, as Cody said, it's um, it has a very easy way um, of interfacing. So um, when you plug this in, when you power this chip up, uh, it creates actually an, a Wi-Fi access point you can connect to. So it creates this Wi-Fi network called uh, Pond. You connect to it um, and then you see this okay so first you get a little warning um uh, yeah uh, kind of like Legal a disclaimer warning tells you yeah. about your new powers and responsibilities <laughs> basically <laughs> um and then you you have this nice web interface where you can just scan for access points and then you know select those that you would like to attack um it's and even run. color coded and friendly for people who don't know what the signal strength means so if you just want to look and go after the green ones you know that that's the strongest one yeah, exactly. So again, you know, tiny chip, super low power, plug it in, connect to its Wi-Fi network. That gives you access to this interface, um, just going into your browser and uh, going to a specified uh, IP address. And then you can control it from there. You don't need to install anything. Um, but that also creates a problem. If you use this um, to, for example, scan for a longer period of time. So, for example, we wanna um, we wanna find client devices nearby, like I don't know, a phone connected to a network. Um, you would usually scan for well, at least like 20, 30 seconds, um, mm -hmm. just so you find something. Because a client device is not always active. You know, it could yeah. be. And a client device is basically a cell phone, a laptop, or like something that's connected to a Wi-Fi access point. Exactly. But scanning for such a long time creates a problem uh, with this web interface. Because you are scanning, uh, you can't surf this, uh, you, yeah, you can't keep up the access point and serving this web interface at the same time. You need to, um, so the chip, it only has this one Wi-Fi antenna, this one interface, right? So it has to mm. close the access point, scan, open it up again, at which point of time you have to manually reconnect, go to the mm. same page, and <clears throat> uh, just super annoying. Mm. And um, yeah, it has a so lot of problems. Beginners think it's beginners think it's broken, because basically yeah. what's happening here is, you're so, let's say you do it on your cell phone. You plug in the deauthor, it creates the access point. <clears throat> you connect to the access point, over your cell phone's Wi-Fi. So cool, everything's great. You run a scan, and if that scan goes on for too long, your phone's just like, hey, the access point's gone. Because it's not creating the access point anymore, it's scanning. It's using that same you know, radio interface to do a scan. So because your phone thinks that you know, suddenly this access point disappeared, it disconnects from it. And there's a lot of people who get started using this, and they feel like they're getting kicked off of it. But in reality, it's just using the radio for such a long time that eventually you know, your phone just decides that the access point's gone. So the big problem here is like if we want to do Wi-Fi hacking stuff, we need to use the radio. But if we want to access the interface and get like the results of our scans back or the ability to put in a new scan, we as the hacker need to use the uh, Wi-Fi radio as a communications uh, platform so we can control the device. So we really have a catch-22 here. We have this great Wi-Fi radio we can do hacking with, but we've also set it up as the only way for us to interface with the device. So really here what's missing from this is an easy way of connecting to this microcontroller from another interface some way that we can keep the wi-fi radio totally free to do more advanced things and that's where this new uh this new interface comes in and why it's so cool is because we're basically making it so that we start out with um we start out with something that is fully ready to use the Wi-Fi radio and attack things around it. We connect via the serial interface, which now we have a way of being able to actually make that run on every operating system. And then we pass commands back and forth through that serial interface instead of tying up the radio, needing to have uh, you know a fancy special looking interface, which again does look amazing and is super useful. But you know if if you compare that to all the things you can do um, just by connecting over the serial interface, really uh, the thing that's missing is. How do we make that easy for people? How do we make it easy for anybody to just plug this into their computer and begin hacking with it the same way they can currently just connect to the Wi-Fi access point and start hacking with it? Do you uh, do you have an idea? Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, as you said, you know, we have we have only this one Wi-Fi radio on this chip and we either use it to interface or to attack. We can't use it for both at the same time, so we have to switch back and forth and that creates all these problems. But um, as you can see here, uh, this thing has a USB connector. So that's also how you program it. You connect it over USB to your computer. And while the chip itself can't actually, um, like it doesn't have full control over USB, you can do a lot of fancy stuff uh, if your microcontroller actually speaks uh, USB natively. Um, but it can do, um, it, it offers a serial connection. That's how, you, how, that's how it's flashed, uh, yeah, over serial. So um, these development boards, they come with a USB connector that have uh, an extra chip on here. That should be this, the smaller one, uh, this one. <laughs> hmm. um, that actually translates the um, serial connection the Wi-Fi chip has to USB. So that when you plug it in, you can talk uh, over that serial connection, but through a USB uh, cable. Uh, mm. with the microcontroller. And that's how we want to talk to it. Because see, um, a serial connection is basically, um, it's like a little terminal. You just give it um, yeah, characters and um, the device can interpret that. Uh, what you do with those is up to the programmer uh, of the firmware that runs on this. So the idea is here, um, new the offer version that uh, uses this interface um, yeah, to basically, yeah, uh, get around this problem of um, using the, um, the antenna for both interfacing and uh, attacking by just not using it to interface. <laughs> you talk to it completely over serial, have a command line interface like you would use command line tools on Linux and, 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 and such. Um, and yeah, just control the complete device uh, over that. So you just plug it into your computer and talk to it over the USB connection. Cool. So then the major change here is we're using another perfectly good interface on the ESP8266 development board to be able to just try to make it easier to not tie up the Wi-Fi radio with an interface. So the whole point of the new dauthor is exploring features that would have been impossible to work on something that was relying on the Wi-Fi radio also being an access point. So while that was really convenient and really cool for beginners, now we're trying to kind of get people who are more interested in advanced Wi-Fi hacking or taking the next step and trying something new or doing Wi-Fi surveillance or something like that uh, to try out some of the things that are possible if you add something that interfaces with the ESP8266 really easily and makes it so that when you're running the dauthor on it, you can have a companion program on your computer that is custom made just for that and able to rapidly first discover it so you don't have to go around trying to find out where it's connected to on your computer. You can just connect to it really easily and start sending commands, um, which is really it kind of as soon as you have that ability, it, it makes really the only thing that's still cool about the web interface and unique is that you can do it on a mobile phone, um, which is awesome. Uh, so, but aside from that, uh, it really means that if you have access to a computer with a USB port, then you can control this and make it run potentially much more powerful things by scripting things on the computer and then having it sent to the dauthor to have it execute it, which is really cool. Because at that point, we're treating this more almost like a wireless network adapter that's like kind of pre-programmed to do certain things than as a, a microcontroller that we're starting with from scratch. At, at this point, it already has a framework to do all these great attacks built into it. So all we need to do is connect to it and start running commands on our computer, and we can get this thing to kind of act like a pre-programmed wireless network adapter, I guess is the way I would um, describe it, which is cool because yeah. wireless network ad adapters are expensive. You know, they they usually <laughs> run like thirty bucks or so to yeah. be able to do some of the attacks we're talking about here. So, yeah, and keep in mind, um, you have to do research if the network adapter you're buying is really working. I think you mm. did a, a a live stream on that a while ago. Yeah. Um, just testing a bunch of those. And then for some of them, you need modified drivers. And sure, something like Kali Linux maybe comes with those pre-installed, but every other system, um, yeah, you're going to have fun installing those. Um, yeah, one I of think... our previous live streams, we crashed a computer by buying a wireless <laughs> network adapter that said it was Kali Linux compatible off of Amazon. And instead, it just like crashed the computer every time we plugged it in. So like, yeah. it's it's cool to have a tool that might not have all the functionality of a wireless network adapter. For example, right now, I don't think we can capture handshakes on it. But if our computer does support you know, packet capture, then we can use this to do the deauthentication. Uh, and then we can use our computer, which might not support packet injection or might not allow us to do deauth attacks, to just capture the, the handshake. So on a Mac OS computer, 
and running this, I can capture handshakes um, and crack passwords on a macOS computer, even though I don't use the wireless card inside the macOS computer to do you know, the deauthentication. I just use this little program, uh, uh, this little microcontroller, plug it into my macOS computer, tell this to do the attack, and then just listen in and capture the information I need to crack the password on my Mac. So that's why this I think that this is really cool. It adds functionality um, for an extremely low cost. Uh, so if you're looking at getting into this sort of thing, Stefan and I have even managed to make these little things uh, be able to simulate traffic between two devices and create a handshake that just one of these is able to put out for practicing um, like capturing a handshake. So these are truly interesting in terms of what you can make them do, uh, provided you're willing to just put a bunch of time into it. Oh, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> um, while I still have this site open, and before we jump right into it, I just want to, I think you brought up a, a good point um, before, and that is the web interface, you know, it is super easy to use, as you can see, you know, everything is very visual, you just click a few buttons, and then you go. But that also means you can only do what is laid out on this page. So right. um, there isn't much you can combine, uh, there's really, you can't really do advanced stuff. But if it's yeah, it's think of it as a GUI application versus uh, a command line application. Th that's basically what it comes down to. With the command line, you can go crazy. You can do scripting. You can you know mess with all the parameters and whatnot and combine different things. But the mm. GUI version only lets you you know click pre uh, configured things basically, and right. that's nice. That's great for beginners. But now we are looking into using this this incredibly cheap device to do some more. Um, advanced stuff. Cool. So all right, what's the solution here? What did you decide on for making the serial interface easier to use for people on you know, potentially any operating system? Right. Um, let me just open this so we can advertise the repository <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. So uh, you can actually find this on GitHub. Um, GitHub.com slash spacehuntech slash hunitor. And um, yeah, as again, shout out to James, who is um, helping me, op who is basically writing this. I'm just helping him. Um, so we decided on Rust, because that's what James is fluid in, but also because it makes it incredibly easy to compile for different operating systems. It's mm. very low level. Um, I see it as like, um, how do I explain this? Like a better version of C. I think that's what they are aiming at. They, the language is not there to, I don't know, like replace high level languages. This is more like a safe version of C and it's not necessarily an easy language uh, all the time, but it's definitely one that is very, very safe and makes, um, makes it very easy to share it as well. Um, I have the, where is it? There it is, the compiling. Um, tutorial very easy. You just install Rust, you clone the repository, and you run um, Cargo. That's it. And then you have the thing compiled yourself on whatever system you're using, basically. And it, the advantage it, of that is that you know it takes into consideration all the different variables on your system and makes a version of it that's specifically going to run just for you. But there are other ways of of being able to install this, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. I just want to cool. say, you know. That's why we chose this, and it makes it very easy because we want this to run everywhere. Because the problem is, sure, we can use other serial terminals um, that are available on the market. You know, um, you know, there's Putty um, for Windows. Putty. Um, what What did you use? You used Screen, right? Um, uh -huh. Wait, what uh, was that, that first one again? On huh? What was that first one again? Uh, Putty. Putty. Yes. <laughs> no, no, you said it perfect. Okay, go on. <laughs> yeah. So um, the problem with those is only some of them are GUI based, some of them are terminal based. They have different parameters, and then some work better than others on different systems. And it's just kind of a mess. There isn't really this one application for serial communication that works cross-platform, is easy to use, and um, you know, yeah. It's just, they, they are all trade-offs um, of these different tools. So we hmm. want something that works cross-platform and makes it as easy as possible. Um, so we are writing our own little serial monitor. That's that's the whole idea of the Hunitor. That's why it's called Hunitor, because it's, it's a serial monitor and chicken and whatever. Um, <laughs> and it's made specifically for this new Dofer version. Sure, you can use this for uh, other projects as well. You can use this on the old Dofer v2 as well. 
but um, we are designing this specifically for that. So um, some of the features you will see later on, um, they are made for this new D offer version and they like could lead to problems if you run this with other other software. So yeah, that's basically the whole idea, making uh, interfacing over serial as easy as possible and available on all platforms. Cool. So in theory, then, the experience for this is supposed to be someone picks up a ESP8266 development board, they flash it with the V3 dauthor, then on whatever, let's say they have you know, your favorite operating system, a Mac OS computer, um, <laughs> they'll plug it into their good old favorite Mac, um, the favorite of all hackers, right, Stefan? What are you using right now? Um, this uh -huh. is Windows, as you can see. Oh, well, that's too bad. I hear you're a big Mac fan, though. But anyway, we'll get into that Don't later. Don't do this. OK, okay sorry. Uh, but anyway, you'll plug this into your, let's say, Mac OS computer. And we'll go ahead and actually just run this Hunitor and be able to then you know, um, see it appear on your screen without needing to dig around in the system looking for what port it's connected to. And then, boom, Like you have the ability to run commands on it. You don't need to you know, worry about even trying to connect to a Wi-Fi interface because it's just that simple. That's what we're shooting for, right? Yeah. OK, cool. And because you were mocking me, there you go. <laughs> I think it's I think it's beautiful. You've really done something with it. I like the the cross out through it because it's kind of it's edgy. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how do I? Yeah, that's good. Since since I put the stickers on, I I like this laptop much more than before. <laughs> it just every time I pick it up, it's just like ah. <laughs> it looks like a, a scene from um, that movie Birds. Like, but if all the birds were triples. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I actually bought this to uh, test software like this on Mac. And um, yeah, we actually have pretty, um, I implemented this now. Do you want to show how you can install it I on do. Mac? Yeah, I do. So one thing I was really impressed by is I, I run a Mac OS, and typically security tools don't always work so great on this. So um, let me just make this bigger. Cool. All right. So. Um, once this is actually clear. So OK, if I want to install something on a Mac OS computer, uh, then basically I have a couple different options. I can do it the hard way, or I can do it via um, Homebrew. So if I have Homebrew installed, which is incredibly easy, um, you can just Google it. It's, it's literally one line in Terminal. I um, can just do something called brew install. And I've already actually added this tab, but um, I'm sure that it's just probably up here. No, I don't. I um, have the README open. Um, you, yeah. If you, if you go on the GitHub page of the Hunitor, it, it's actually described here. You install home, Homebrew, it's actually linked. So you can just go to the side. There's the one liner you copy paste into the terminal. Um, and then you do brew tab space on tech Hunitor. The, what it does is it's uh, adding um, this repository to oh, oh. yeah your, your Homebrew installation. And then you can do brew install Hunitor. The only uh, the only reason you have to do this first step is because brew install Hunitor won't work because Hunitor is not part of their core um, packages yet. Yet. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Here's that string of text I was looking okay. for. So we have um, brew tap uh, space Unit tech and Hunitor, and then that will actually add it to my local repository of things I can install. So if you have a Mac OS system and you don't have a package manager um, and you want to try stuff like like this out, Brew uh, Homebrew is like really the way to go because it makes it so easy to you know try out other security researchers' projects um, and just install them and have them compiled uh, in a way that's just super easy to get set up on a macOS system. So if you're jealous of like your Ubuntu computer and you wish you could install things uh, the same way, then you actually can. So there we go. Um, you can see that I've now added this. So if I want to do Brew install Hunitor. then that should be able to install it just like that. So if I was totally new to this project, I would just go over to the uh, GitHub repository, basically run these two terminal commands, and then we should be able to have it installed. And of course, I've already installed it on my computer, but um, this is just the way it would look. See, it's already installed, already up to date. So I can also um, rebrew it or whatever to reinstall it, but no, I don't want to. Instead, I'm just going to run it. So then the last step is, again, just running the program I installed. Look at how lazy I am. OK, cool. And <laughs> you just type Hunitor and press Enter. Exactly. Yeah. 
And then I get this giant intergalactic chicken, which I think is beautiful. And <laughs> I also get a list of all the available serial ports. Um, so this is just asking me, hey, like where have you installed this? Now, I, if I also rerun this and I have it not plugged in, um, I believe it'll, let me cancel this. I believe it'll wait and try to and try to wait. Okay, plug your deauthor in or type the port ID or name. Okay, so I'll plug it in. Boom, it's connected. Hey, that was before, it. before we go on, maybe uh, we should say some words uh, for Linux and Windows users. <laughs> oh, who cares about that? Yeah, we, we should. <laughs> uh, so, that, so this is just how it's done very, very quickly and easily on Mac OS. But yeah, let's uh, let's go over to stuff on screen and see um, how we can do this on Windows. Um, yeah, so um, when you're on the GitHub page, you can, oh, this is the new layout. Now you have, have to click here. Um, on to get to the releases. Um, okay, so um, yeah, this is where the releases are, and you can see there's a Hunito for Linux, a Hunito for Mac, and a Hunito for Windows. So Windows is really easy. You just download the .exe file, and um, I think I have it here. Yeah, so uh, you have that. You double click it. There you go. You're done. And it just opens. Yeah. Uh, Linux, pretty much the same, um, but you might have to start it from the command line. So you have to download this and give it permission to be executed. So, so that would be... So chmod plus x. Exactly. Um, and then run it over terminal. Um, if your distribution isn't actually like doing it by default, then you can just double click it. Um, depends on your setup, I guess. Um, hmm. But yeah. That's that's it. That's how you do it. There is no packet manager for Windows and Linux yet. I set up the homebrew thing actually today, um, mm -hmm. but we are looking at uh, getting this into more packet managers to make the installation process easier. So if you're watching this uh, later on, definitely check out the uh, GitHub repository, scroll down through the readme, and if you see something here, um, then it means you know there's there's another better installation method, and you don't actually have to download um, the uh, binaries yourself. But because oh, yeah. a, a packet like manager it's is coming hoon. It's coming hoon, yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. All right. OK. All right, so we've already showed off then that the idea for this, for Mac OS anyway, is, is exactly the way we envisioned it. We went ahead and added it via package manager, super simple. Then we plugged it in, and it was able to just detect our deauthor and connect to it. There was I didn't even have to tell it what port it was on. Although when I ran it the first time, when it was already connected, I could select which port I wanted to connect to. So if for some reason I had a bunch of them connected, I guess I could you know choose them by port if uh, that's what I wanted to do. Huh. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Could I have multiple? Um, I guess I could just have a bunch of deauthors um, then plugged in on different ports and just connected them via different uh, Hunitor windows, right? Yeah, that should cool. work. Yeah. Yeah, OK, that's interesting. I didn't, I'd think that I could just like chain them together like that, but I probably could. Yeah, you just can't have two Hunitors open that connect to the same serial port. That wouldn't work, but. Right, right, yeah. right. OK, cool. So we've gotten to the point that we are then, uh, well, you haven't yet, so you're not connected yet. But uh, oh, how yeah. does that look on Windows? Uh, same way. Um, so I have mine already plugged in. I'm just gonna. I know it's COM3 because COM1 is usually. I don't know what is what what's up with COM1 and Windows computers. So, the, on a lot of systems, it's just there. I don't know what it's for. Um, maybe someone smart in the comments is gonna point it out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, COM3 is actually the offer. So um, I say zero for COM3. You cannot also type COM3 by the way. Um, and now it says, hey, I'm connected. So at this point, you know, you can just. You know, you select the port, and if you don't know which port it is, um, then you just plug the device in or, or plug it out and in again, and then it will connect automatically. So this is really, you know, <laughs> this is idiot proof, basically. <laughs> and you don't have to mess with any serial settings. You don't have to set baud rate and how many bits and all that stuff. That's already done for you. It it uses the settings specifically for the deauthor. So again, you know, while theoretically you could use this with other serial applications as well, um, the settings are hard coded in for the deauthor because this is a deauthor specific application. But you know, if you are interested, you could still fork the source code, change those things, and create something yourself because this is all open source. Um, Got but it. Yeah. 
So another thing that we now have access to is there is the new start feature. And then there's also a much more expanded like help section. Um, you don't right. probably don't want to show any Wi-Fi stuff uh, yet. So maybe we can look at the help first. Yeah. Um, help, that's going to that's gonna be interesting. Boom. Boom. Oh, do one thing, because uh, I feel like we are forgetting this if I don't mention this now. As you can see, this is colored, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's something that doesn't work over the serial connection itself. That's just sending raw, like, ASCII characters. There's no coloring in there. So while a usual um, or any other serial terminal would just show everything in just black and white here, um, here we actually have a color scheme. And that's programmed into the Hunitor. And that just that's makes cool. everything a bit more readable. So you know, like, kind of, you know, this is a, oh, whoops. You kind of know this is a divider and like, okay, this is a command. There's some information here and these are the parameters because they are green. Um, yeah, so that's that's a little thing that um, I think really helps reading the entire output that just wouldn't be as readable otherwise. And yeah, the help command is quite extensive. As you can see, there are a bunch of commands here and you see they all have a long list of parameters you can, you can give them. Right, um, so this is super customizable. Yes, and that's what we, we talked about earlier. Um, you can't do this over web interface. Um, the, even if we could come up with some way um, putting this, this onto a website, the ESP would have a hard time um, hosting all of this. Basically, mm. um, yeah. So we're doing uh, so we're doing a lot of the the stuff we would normally do on the ESP, uh, or at least we're trying to on the side of the Hunitor. So we're able to do like the color schemes, all the other like fancier stuff by just having a little bit of the work offloaded. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, exactly. Oh, cool. Have well, I, have if I you showed you the chicken command. Oh, yeah. it's so good. Okay, yeah, that should that should always be your first command to check out um, when you're running this. Make sure that the chicken command is working, because if it's not working, then something's broken. Yeah, I think we had that on the first live stream uh, about the video. <laughs> and I immediately fixed it. <laughs> good, 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 good. OK, well, maybe we should switch over to my screen so we can do some uh, actual scanning of stuff, because I really like some of the vendor searches and other things you can do now. So one thing I want to try to do is, let's say that I know that my target has an Apple device, or I know my target has a Samsung device, or I basically know I can look and see like what kind of device I'm looking for. So I might physically know what it looks like, but identifying it over the network can be a lot harder. So if I know that there's an Apple device that's near me, so it's probably going to have the strongest signal strength, how would I actually start targeting that device? How would I track the device? Um, well, we would have to find the MAC address. And of course, I can see maybe what network I know it's connected to. But there's a new feature built into this that I think is really cool, where we can basically use this little microcontroller to run a scan and then filter by vendor, which is awesome. So to, not to get too technical about, about it, but the way that this works is the MAC address is actually the first half of it is set by the vendor. And it's you can look that up to determine the manufacturer of the device, because they have to use that first part of the MAC address, because it's their kind of assigned space to, to um, label their products with. So in this case, we're going to be reading the MAC addresses, checking a database to see what manufacturer it is. And that will allow us to, for example, zero in on a Mac OS computer, um, which on this end is going to be my production computer that's connected to Wi-Fi. So how would we do that? Well, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can freestyle, and we can just use these commands. If I type help, we can just use the um, search uh, scan command. I believe, yeah, the scan command. Uh, we can do all sorts of stuff with that to customize what we're looking for. So we can look for either access points, which are the actual networks, or stations, which are devices connected to that network. So if I just type scan, the default scan is going to go ahead and scan on a lot of different channels, including some ones that aren't necessarily useful in the United States. And we're just scanning here. We're not broadcasting anything. So you know, whoever in the in the comments is going to be like, it's channel 14 is illegal in America. It's like, yeah, well, we're going to catch someone using it by scanning. Because um, you know we're not making anything on it. OK, so we see that there's a couple of different, whoa. Whoa. OK, now it's done. So we see the results. And here, we can see information about the vendor. So we have something by our friends at Alpha Wireless. Uh, and then we also have some other devices, one of which is a Apple device. So this is probably the one we're looking for. But when I type results, 
it should display the result to the scan. And then I can type results dash vendor. And then I, this has to be exact, so A-P-P-L-E with a capital A. And cool. The only result I have now is an Apple device. So if I knew that my target had an Apple device, what did I just do? In a couple of commands, I ran a scan. And then I filtered that scan down so I was only getting the type of device that I'm hunting for. So this is really useful also if I wanted to find a list of, I don't know, security cameras that were running over Wi-Fi, target all of them, and I don't know, just check to see if they still work after being blasted off the internet relentlessly, of course, with permission. Um, so this is a really powerful way where someone who knows a little bit about Wi-Fi hacking can plug this in, quickly run a scan, identify devices by vendor, and then start targeting them all using this really sweet, really uh, colorful web interface. Or sorry, not web interface, serial interface. We're moving away from the web interface. So I think that, for one, this makes me feel more like a hacker, I think, than, um, <laughs> than just using uh, the web interface. And for two, you can see that if I type help, the number of customizations that you can make to these commands where maybe I want to run a really long scan, or I only want to scan um, a couple of channels, or I want to spend more time on each channel to make sure I'm, I'm detecting more devices that are using that channel. Or if I identify a ch an access point I'm interested in, I can only listen on that one channel and see every single piece of traffic that is uh, going through it. All of these are ways that we can take the default just scan parameter and modify it to a specific use case. But some of the other stuff here that I really like is even more advanced, I think, and allows us to pull information out of devices. So I'm not sure if we're, I think we're running up on our time. Um, I'm not sure how much, I think we have like four minutes or so. So Stefan, maybe um, walk me through how we can um, do some of the uh, attacks where we're basically looking for device, uh, looking for networks that a device has connected to before. Um, to a uh, device, okay. Um, so I guess we would just start scanning. You already have um scan results i can't see your screen uh through my oh yeah so i already have scan results um oh yeah i forgot that you couldn't see that but yeah i already have scan results and i'm also um on my phone generating some traffic so if i just want to um scan for stations i can type scan um st right mm -hmm. or yeah and then uh is it just dash t for time or is it just yeah. all time all right, so dash T for time, and then I'll do 30 seconds. So basically scanning on all channels for 30 seconds. Cool, and you can see it even confirms all the arguments I've made here. And so it's like, OK, um, we're going to do a scan time for 30 seconds. It's going to run looking for this. And um, oh, there we go. OK, so while we're doing this, we can already start to see that this is detecting probe requests. And what that means is that there's devices near us that are putting out requests for Wi-Fi networks that are not here. It's basically Wi-Fi networks they've been connected to in the past. So we're intercepting that. And we're able to see that even though this uh, this device might not be connected currently, we are able to uh, detect that it's looking for nearby Wi-Fi networks. So OK, um, the scan is done. And I have one result that is also setting up probe requests. How would I start listening um, to see if this device is going to give up any more information? Um... You could, so you could continue scanning uh, mm -hmm. for stations, but um, set it to the channel this device is working on. That would be one way, and just see if there are more probe requests or whatever it's sending out. Um, you could also try sending out beacons with the SSID um, mm. that you captured using the probe request, and just see how the device is reacting. Um, is it a network that's actually there? No, it's not. Interesting. So yeah. you could, yeah, just I would, I would just send some beacons and see if the device connects. Okay, let's try it. How to uh, walk me through how I do that? Sorry. Um, good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, for, oh, I just closed the Huni tour. Dang. Wait. Probe your beacon. So the bean command takes uh, an SSID. So we would just give it that uh, network name. So beacon dash SSID. And then uh, you can put the SSID in quotes so that it would support um, spaces and such. OK. And that's it? Um, you can. Um, 
do a dash mon at the end as well, because then it's scanning for authentications. Oh, chip. no. I press Control C to end it. So what's the best way to end a scan that's in progress? Stop. Oh, just press stop. Yeah, OK. Type stop. I did the same thing. That's why I had to restart mine as well a second ago. Yeah, it's um, maybe that's something on the to-do list for the Hunitor to capture that, to translate a Control C into a stop. But I, I'm not sure um, how much this is actually possible. Uh, T20. OK, so I'm going to scan for stations. Let it run its scan. And then hopefully, when it finds something, and if not, then you know we're pretty much close on time anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. But either way, I still wanted to show off, oh no, it didn't find any. OK, well, we'll save that for next time. But this has been an example, at least, of how we can get started with doing these more advanced attacks or starting to you know, create fake networks. Or And we were able to successfully create this fake network before I closed out, unfortunately. But uh, the point of this attack is I would be able to start with the dash mon command. I would be able to start listening in on anything that this uh, device is doing when it's trying to you know, connect to it. So if there were a number of different devices in the room that had all connected to this before, they would kind of reveal themselves by attempting to connect back to this fake network we were putting out. So all right, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, Thank you for showing us this tool, because I think that the major barrier to entry for people that want to start working with microcontrollers like this is just getting set up. If you can flash it really easily, that's great. But if there's no way for a normal person to begin just getting this thing to do what they want it to do, they feel kind of restricted or maybe even sometimes overwhelmed by all the different things that are out there. And it can be hard to know really you know, what's the best serial monitor device, what's the best way of interfacing with this thing. And now that there's a dedicated way of on any operating system getting set up with a really cheap, really powerful open source tool. I think that a lot more people who hadn't considered trying out some of this cool Wi-Fi hacking stuff might be interested in seeing all the cool stuff you can do with Wi-Fi hacking. Because aside from just attacking devices and kicking them off the network, there's also some of these interesting things like scanning to see if a device has connected to a network before, and then popping up a fake network and seeing if that device reacts. So we know that we could capture the device with a fake network. And that opens the door for all sorts of other attacks, either with a, a device with more horsepower. So you know, we could use this to basically figure out what nearby devices would connect to, and then use our computer to create a Wi-Fi network that has a phishing page attached. Or we can even do it for signals intelligence. So we can figure out maybe that a person in a group had been to a specific location and joined that Wi-Fi network and hadn't told anyone else. Well, if we wanted to know that you know someone was uh, relaxing down at the strip club when they were supposed to be working, we could top up a fake version of the strip club Wi-Fi network. And if your phone is the only one connecting to it, it means you've been there. So there's lots of different ways we can use this simple, easy interface, uh, which is Rust-based, again, very cool, uh, to get set up with an ESP8266 8266 D author, no matter what operating system you have. And I think that, I don't know, if, you, if you're interested in this sort of Wi Fi hacking stuff, if you want to see if your camera, if your home Wi Fi network is vulnerable, you should definitely check out this project. Um, Stefan, where do we find it? It's uh, at on GitHub, but is that the fastest way? For the Hunitor? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay, cool. There is, there is no fancy domain yet. Com <laughs> coming, coming Hun. Coming home. All right. So right now, if you want to check it out, you can go to github.com slash spacehoontech uh, slash hunitor, H-U-H-N-I-T-O-R, which means chickenator in German, <laughs> if you didn't know that. Sure. Cool. Cool, cool. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on another episode of Hacking with Friends. A big special shout out to Veronis for bringing you guys content like this. If you like it, make sure to check out the Cyber Attack Lab and the PowerShell Workshop uh, that teaches you all sorts of great Active Directory scripting things. It's free, and uh, you guys will probably really enjoy it if you are ever dealing with PowerShell or Active Directory, especially in an enterprise environment. So thank you to them for bringing us this great content. Thank you to you for watching it and sharing it with anyone you think will like it. And I hope Hope I'll see you guys next week when we, or actually, no, hope we see you guys. We do this every Tuesday and Friday. So check us out on the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash security forward. That's security FWD. And yeah, we'll see you then. Bye. Bye.